Hello, and welcome to all those joining us on the live stream. Uh, so this is me, uh, my name's Matt Jarvis. I am Director of Developer Relations at a cybersecurity company called Sneak. Uh, I'm also the Vice Chair of Open UK, which is the uh, industry body for open source in the UK, a CNCF ambassador, and I run a whole bunch of other open source related events. And a very good afternoon. I am Andy from Control Plane. I am a founder and CEO. We are a cloud native security consultancy based out of London. We work in the US and in APAC with regulated organizations. I'm also very proud to be involved with CNCF's Tag Security as a co-chair, where we help projects to escalate through the ranks of the CNCF by providing assurance, secure end user usage, and threat modeling and advisory to the project. And with my uh, venerable friend, uh, Mr. Jarvis, I'm the CISO at Open UK, where we work to try and avoid foot guns in UK government policy. So, today, unsurprisingly, we're talking about S-bombs. Um, and there's going to be a, uh, a rather extreme amount of Yogi Bear memes in this talk. Uh, so, for those of you who may be younger than a certain age and don't know anything about Yogi Bear, I would encourage you to check it out on YouTube. Um, so to get started, and uh, for those of you who maybe have only just started to hear about S-bombs, um, let's have a quick primer on what one actually is. Um, we'll start with some definitions. Uh, so it is an acronym for Software Bill of Materials, um, which doesn't tell us very much. And then if we, uh, we look at NTIA's s FAQ, and I'm not going to read all this out because it's incredibly wordy and um, a lot of other words. And Andy and I have, have coined an alternative definition, which is just a bunch of JSON, which uh, we think is very catchy. But it's actually not true because S-bombs can also be in XML and I think various other formats maybe. But uh, So um, basically, an S-bomb is just some structured data that tells us uh, about the relationships between elements um, that make up our software. Um, but we already have structured data sources that do exactly that um, in our package repositories. So RPM, DEB, NPM, a whole bunch of others, all basically work like that. So what makes SBOMs um, inherently better than any of those existing sources? Well, basically absolutely nothing. Um, nothing makes them inherently more valuable than any of those things. It's all just software composition analysis. Um, but that's not to say that SBOMs aren't valuable. Um, they are a very important step in improving how we manage supply chain security by giving us standardized, machine-readable ways of sharing that information. So if I'm a developer, I can use the SBOM to understand the dependency tree of a big piece of software. If I'm in a security team, I have a library of things that my infrastructure contains that I can analyze when the next big CVE comes along. Um, but for SBOMs to be really effective, we need to consider a lot more than just the basic information that they contain. Um, how we create them, how we manage them, and most importantly, how we trust them is really the key to uh, extrapolating that value. SBOMs are a point in time capture of a set of dependency data. And like your package repository's database, they represent only the moment that they were created. So it's critical to think about them as the moment in time when we think about what is going to be in the thing that we create. Logically, it makes sense for us to create our SBOM at the point that we create our software artifact, i.e. when it was built or when it was packaged. This ensures that the moment in time in which we're encapsulating this data about the software artifact actually corresponds to when the software was created and therefore the dependency tree that it was built with. This probably means creating the SBOM in our build system, through our CICD and considering it an output of our build in exactly the same way that tests execute, uh, test metadata and the packaging and the executables themselves are captured and logged. However, this does somewhat depend upon what we expect our SBOM to contain. As it's a point in time, 
some of the information it contains may have been invalidated by the time it's used or consumed. CVEs could have been released, zero days are inherently new, and therefore the consumers of the software may receive an incomplete package for the, sorry, an incomplete picture for the package and any dependencies that are packaged in it if there's also vulnerability data there. We'll look a bit later at the various ways in which SBOMs and friends can encapsulate this, but perhaps it makes sense to first of all create an SBOM where we actually ingest a piece of software into our system in order to ensure the point of time is capturing when we acquired it. That could mean regenerating an SBOM in much the same way as scanning and software composition analysis tools do in order to understand the software we're going to run in production. So perhaps our point in time should also be the first time we deploy that software to our production systems. Any or all of these approaches have their own merits, but probably from a logical and ease of adoption perspective, it makes the most sense to create the SBOM at build time and then to scan the SBOM to update any vulnerability data at the point of use. Whichever way ends up being the best route for you, the most important questions around SBOMs are really around trust. So trust is fundamental to human and technological interactions, deeply rooted in authority and accepted on an implicit and explicit level in our daily lives. In technology, the authenticity of the authors of software and hardware is verified through cryptography, and our trust as a consumer is extended to new producers. This is much like having faith in a restaurateur's complex dish. Its ingredients and safe preparation, ensuring no impurities or unknown elements are added. In contrast to some other industries where responsibility models exist, software lacks a trusted food standards agency or authority to vet the entire digital supply chain for safety, sanctity and security, which means we need to extend our trust to every producer of software individually. Trust in software builds of materials depends on the producer and their adherence to practices that lead to a more robust and trustworthy software supply chain. Our Software Food Standards Authority would check the developers, the CICD, the packaging infrastructure, the owner of the signing keys we use to asynchronously verify their claims, as well as the guarantee that no other malicious individuals have access to those keys and the underwriting of our security guarantees from a third party that guarantees compliance, observing the system and the promises made by the standardizing authority. Tech is a long way from the levels of trust shown in human food supply chains at this point in time. So we're going to come back a bit to, to some of that uh, complexity that I think Andy's just uh, alluded to in a second, but let's talk about the, uh, the format of SBOMs to start with. Uh, with a, as with almost all formats, um, there are part of the standards which are mandatory and loads and loads of parts that are optional. Uh, a lot of the tools that um, create SBOMs currently really only deal with the mandatory elements of the SBOM, which means that not all SBOMs are created equal. And there's an emerging set of tools for testing the quality of an SBOM. Uh, we've got some of them here, SBOM scorecard from eBay, SBOM QS from Interlink, and other tools from organizations like NTIA. Um, this is clearly a highly subjective field because the definition of what quality is is going to differ from organization to organization. But the way all of these tools work is to present back um, scoring based on different parts of the data contained in the SBOM, things like full package URLs, um, license information, stuff like that. And what's really interesting about this kind of emerging field of quality testing in SBOMs is that we can look at these tools as reflecting what users think will be important to them in terms of the kinds of information contained in SBOMs. And because of that, uh, we think that these kinds of tools are likely to influence the development of the SBOM creation tools themselves. So if we take a quick look at an SBOM, this is an entirely correct one. Um, I've snipped it for brevity, but it, it's a Cycle MDX one, and it fully meets the Cycle MDX specification. And we can see it contains um, information about libraries and then information about um, the dependencies for that, uh, for that particular package. But if we test this SBOM with SBOM scorecard, 
Uh, the overall score that it gives this SBOM is 77%. And that's based mainly on the fact that there is no licence information contained in this SBOM. Now, there isn't a hard requirement in the spec for licence information, but it's clearly seen as important because all of the quality testing tools score for it. Like I said, this is entirely subjective because it will really be down to your organisation which things are important to see in an SBOM. But, and once all of our software starts being shipped with SBOMs, we can imagine wanting to test the quality of the SBOM documents as we ingest that particular piece of software. And one way to do this might be to use uh, policies in our CICD um, pipelines and potentially gate on poor quality SBOM documents. And here we can leverage existing policy tools like Open Policy Agent uh, to build these tests into our pipelines. Here's an example of a Rego test, um, which will fail if the SBOM quality score from SBOM scorecard is less than eight. And if we run this test uh, locally using um, conf test on that SBOM we just looked at, we can see the SBOM fails to pass this policy. So, given that we've got a lot of optional fields and our tools may not deal with all of those fields, we can imagine that users might want to enrich their SBOMs to add additional relevant data that they care about. So perhaps we want to add that license information, perhaps we want richer, uh, more detailed information about the components and their, um, their authors, their, where they've come from, or, or even things like security vulnerabilities. And again, there's emerging tooling to do SBOM enrichment that allows us to add other interesting data from different data sources into your basic SBOMs. Um, Parlay is an open source tool um, from Sneak that does exactly that. It enriches SBOMs to add uh, more detailed package data, um, security scoring using the scorecard system from OpenSSF, and even vulnerability data um, from Sneak. So if we go back to this original SBOM example, we can see we've got that package data in there, but it's pretty minimal, doesn't contain anything about licenses, which we know scored it down on the quality tests. So one of the sources that Parlay supports is Ecosystems. This is a very cool site, contains a ton of open data about um, packages, and it's all available via an API. So, if we, um, we take a look at enriching our original SBOM with Parlay, we can see the, uh, the CLI um, command at the top to create a new SBOM. And I've actually split this into two columns because it's a bit more readable for a slide. But when we look at the new SBOM, we can see the information about the package is tons richer. We not only have the license information, we have detailed information about the supplier, we have lots of external references to uh, websites and things like that, and we have a bunch of different properties, including the uh, published date and, and various tags from ecosystems. And if we retest this enriched SBOM, we could see that it now scores much more highly on this particular uh, quality test. Another avenue for enrichment is adding the OpenSSF scorecards to our SBOMs. If you're not familiar with the scorecard um, stuff, it's a major project funded by the OpenSSF, which runs a whole bunch of checks on open source repositories for not only security data, but community health, licenses, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, these are all machine readable and again accessible via an API. So if we look again at enriching our original SBOM with the OpenSSF scorecard data, here we can see that, uh, that Parlay's added this external references uh, section with the URL for the scorecard. And it's not very readable, I don't think, on this particular slide. But if we navigate to that URL, we can actually view all those scorecard scores in JSON. And then this final example is, is enriching with vulnerability data. In this case, it's using Snake, obviously, but other security tools are available. Um, what, what's happening here is we're embedding the vulnerability data directly in the SBOM. And Andy's going to talk a bit more about this uh, later, but what, what, this is one of the forms that a thing called vulnerability disclosure report can take, where we um, actually embed it directly in the SBOM itself in this vulnerability section. Um, there are a couple of different formats that a VDR document can take, and uh, again, Andy's going to talk about that in a minute. 
But, uh, you know, other than that, you're seeing this, all this security data. Again, this is SNP for brevity. There's a lot more stuff gets put in here, but you've got all that information about each individual CVE directly into the SBOM. So, um, just to finish off on enrichment, loads of possibilities for customization. It's massively subjective. It's really going to depend on um, what your organization considers to be important. And, um, you know, you can really go wild here, add multiple sources, and really add a lot more depth to that, to that basic SBOM. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so, we can enrich the core SBOM itself with this data, which gives us something that consumers have trust in for that relevant point in time. And why do we want to do this? Well, software is never entirely secure. Nothing can be entirely secured in, in the history of humanity. Perhaps uh, Fort Knox might be a current exception. But software that stands still will die. So we must move our dependencies forward. They will get vulnerabilities, as is natural, as we look to move software forward. And we want to take advantage of new features. New features bring risk of those vulnerabilities. But companies that don't ship features will be beaten by less risk-averse organizations. So, can we use SBOMs to mitigate this risk for our organization? And if we do, what are we risking? If we trust an SBOM too much, and the SBOM then results in compromise, it can lead to software implants. This is true for software in general. There's nothing unique about SBOMs, but in order to meta observe the SBOMs that we're then building this new trust relationship with, this is how we build a threat library and then model our behaviors in a way to quantifiably build controls into our pipelines that we'll look at as we progress. Remote code execution, a host of further threats, reasonably standard, but let's look at exactly what that means. An SBOM contains potentially a dependency with a vulnerability. And so in order to indicate this to the consumer of the SBOM, the producer, the vendor, or a trusted third party can provide one of these two documents, uh, a VEX or, or a VDR. So these software builds and materials are valuable tools, but come short when falling or failing to distinguish between exploitable and non-exploitable vulnerabilities in the dependency tree. So early adopters have stepped up to the plate here, proposing new standards and updates to mitigate these threats. Amongst them are VDR, CSAF, VEX, and OpenVEX, each making its mark in the realm of vulnerability management. We can think about security scanners as over-eager watchdogs, sometimes barking when there's no one at the door, there's no intruder. So imagine being alerted to a vulnerability that's already been patched, or is not present, or in fact is not executable because it's an unreachable code path or a function in a library that's not even called by the consuming software. This is where these vulnerability disclosure exploitability libraries and formats come into play. We teach our watchdog new tricks by cutting through the noise and providing a VEX document. That document indicates that a trusted third party or the vendor potentially has verified that the software is not vulnerable to the specific CVE that the security scanner knows is in that version. So for example, when OpenSSL has a vulnerability in a certain type of cryptography that it uses, if an application consumes OpenSSL but doesn't use that cipher, you can provide a VEX to say, we know that we're not impacted by this vulnerability. That means vulnerability assessors all of a sudden can run vulnerable code in production. This reduces the burden on patches, security teams, and uh, generally squeezed selection of burnt out cybersecurity individuals. So the triumvirate of vulnerability management, VDR, VEX, and the newer OpenVEX. Vulnerability disclosure reports is the fundamental resource providing a list of vulnerabilities published by software vendors. However, it lacks a common reporting standard for programmatic consumption. On the other hand, vulnerability exploitability exchange format, practically unpronounceable, or VEX, bridges this gap by sharing information about the status of vulnerabilities and OpenVEX takes this one step further, providing an, impl an implementation of VEX that is interoperable and embeddable in any SBOM specification. There is, um, it's, it's a little bit of a fork looking at trying to move the discussion around VEX forward more quickly, because these things have come from US government bodies and have the uh, slightly turgid pace of progress that you might expect from uh, large 
committee-driven decisions. So let's attack the S-bomb. It hasn't done anything to us yet. There are two classes of threat that we're looking at here, malicious and accidental. Malicious threats are deliberately introduced by an attacker with the intent to cause harm to the consumer of the S-bomb. For example, trivially, an attacker could inject malicious code into the package that the S-bomb is describing, or create a fictional release with a tampered S-bomb. There are lots of predicates required for both of those, so we'll discuss those in some more detail. Accidental threats are, of course, introduced unintentionally due to errors or omissions. For example, an, an S-bomb may be incorrect or outdated, or perhaps contain confidential internal network information. Let's look at how and where these can happen. So first, of course, we care about where the S-bomb was generated and to what depth. Closed source and compiled software may have components that can't be identified with software composition analysis after they're composed or built, so the S-bombs must be generated at build time. But they can't be validated unless the consumer rebuilds them from source. On the other hand, open source software can be scanned when it's ingested into an organization, but then it's just software composition analysis with the additional hurdle of having to trust a third party not to tamper with or make mistakes in their SBOM. So we're not replacing software composition analysis, but we can make additional verifications to enhance our trust levels in it. Can we make this more complicated? Yes, indeed we can. So let's talk about the threats that can occur mapped to this fictional build lifecycle. Uh, local compromises are, of course, problematic. If someone compromises your local machine, your signing keys, your identity, either as SSH or Git keys, everything from that point onward is compromised. A signed and valid SBOM for an application with malicious implants or vulnerabilities provides a false sense of security, so local developer compromise is, of course, our first issue, as it would be for any other system or, in fact, whether there's an SBOM there or not. We get into the source and data repository. A compromise of a source repo where an attacker can gain control over the source to make the producer release a vulnerable version unknowingly. So the same style of attack as a local compromise, just performed remotely. Predicates or preconditions probably include access to the developer's SSH key or access to their GPG key, or perhaps they've left their device unlocked and they've just gone into the GitHub and the web UI. Whether we should trust the GitHub web UI Webflow signing key is uh, a great, great unanswered question. Dependency confusion. This is not an SBOM problem. This is related to package manager, um, how package managers resolve the names of specific packages. So if I'm using an internal registry and I have a namespace for that internal registry and then someone goes and registers that same name on a public registry, the resolution of the package manifest, your package JSON, for example, first goes to the public registry. So it's possible to gain remote code execution into the network for some of the largest organizations um, in, uh, in the world as of early last year when this new supply chain attack came about. Again, dependency confusion relies on the package manager, but if we have an SBOM behind it, we would then need to forge that in a similar way. Build and verification. Probably the most dangerous threat here is an incomplete SBOM generation. Software authors are incentivized to not include their full suite of dependencies transitive and so the, a huge call graph of dependencies because they're then responsible for the management and patching of the CVEs all the way down that tree. So a lot of SBOMs will generate just the top level of dependencies and then it's down to the maintainer of that package whether a vulnerability in their package dependency tree is reported as a CVE in the top package or not. This is almost an intractable problem. The opposite side of this, which we'll get to, is alert blindness from massive dependency graphs, and then we fail to be able to prioritize the criticality of patching these things. Compromised SBOM generation tooling. I mean, this is the reflections on trusting trust. If your compiler is compromised, if your fundamental operating system components, your certificate authorities, or the kernel, it's similar to local device compromise, but again, just another concern to think about in our CICD. Code injection, malicious but syntactically correct source code into the software's CICD. This is the SolarWinds style of attack. It's fine to take everything, validate, fully, uh, fully validate in terms of the source code, and then just at the point of compilation, drop in an implant. It's then signed and appears to be legitimate as it's distributed. A difficult problem to solve, but there are startups who are looking 
uh, how to trace the provenance of the build and ensure that all the build steps are known and detect these things. Um, the Google team have just uh, introduced a capability model for Golang, whereby the behavior expected from an application is defined in terms of capabilities. And then if the build suddenly starts making network calls to unknown third parties, well, you can be sure that we've got some unintended behavior somewhere in the dependency tree. We have confidential data leakage. Perhaps the package URLs refer to internal systems or the external references refer to things that an attacker could use in the event of potential intrusion. Version regression, if as a defender, I have allow listed a specific version because we needed to get to production, but then we rolled forward. If we can regress down to that version and get the SBOM to be signed in the package building process, again, we've bypassed a legitimate process. Weak hash algorithms, things like shattered will allow us to pack individual files with lots of junk and rubbish off the end, but then we have a hash collision attack. These are much cheaper. SHA-1 is effectively broken for this mechanism. We can mitigate this by hashing multiple different hash types, so SHA-1 through 512 in our uh, SBOM, and then validating one or all of them, um, or just not using a broken hash algorithm. Provenance manipulation, altering or signing tampered provenance data to make malicious changes appear legitimate. Again, there is an expectation that the signing keys and the build infrastructure are compromised, which is, again, a significant precondition. This may not be your biggest problem if you have a, a foreign party in your build infrastructure. And outdated SBOM content. You need to ship the correct SBOM, of course, for the relevant uh, software. A proven release, metadata tampering. Again, we need the signing keys and we should be able to revalidate these things, but if we receive an SBOM and don't validate it, what was the point of doing it in the first place? And finally, at this point, signing an SBOM with compromised keys. Those keys must be held under lock and other key. Uh, it's unlikely that we'd see Faraday cages for these kind of things. So again, the build infrastructure must be sacrosanct. There's a, there's a con concept of Salsa minus one, so we'll get to Salsa in a moment, whereby the assumption of secure build infrastructure that Salsa makes must be verified. You know, if we're using outdated Jenkins installs, we've probably got a vulnerable plugin. The sandbox model brings everything into the same plugin. I meant to say model, but I said model, perhaps Freudian incorrectness. Okay, on the package repository and distribution, we're almost there. Fictional dependency release, so creating a fictional version of the software and SBOM, or tricking users into downloading that malicious version. Again, the precondition is compromised but this is a way that the SBOM is not providing the safety that we expect it to. Social engineering attacks, this might be a way to get access to these pieces of infrastructure in the first place. Man in the middle, we're assuming that someone's broken network security at this point, or the signing keys, so cryptography is not reliable. For some large organizations, unfortunately, this is de rigueur. Package assessment, lack of contextual verification. If we're given this information, we have to use it, because it makes no sense to distribute without verifying. It's a zero trust-esque metaphor. Compromised or outdated threat intelligence. It's all very well to, uh, so often for large organizations with air gaps, it is a daily sneak aware routine to download the latest CVE database, walk it across the air gap and plug it into another system. If that process can be disrupted, we won't be able to see what vulnerabilities exist inside the system. Again, there are mitigations. Um, especially when scanning things offline and outside of those environments. And transitive dependency proliferation. Talking about that first level of depth of SBOM dependency listing, the opposite is if we include everything. So the entire graph of dependencies all the way back, it becomes incredibly difficult to manage. This is the reality that vulnerability assessors have to deal with, but it's two sides of... Uh, uh, a not very, very pleasant coin. And finally, deploying operations. If we are providing an effective software firewall at the extremity of our organization to ingest untrusted open source software and third party code, and somebody gets into that validation infrastructure, again, all, all bets are off. These are some of these obvious threats, but they're things that make the SBOM uh, just contextualize the way that we need to be. Um, careful with it. So, of course, this all smells a lot like Salsa, the supply chain security framework, which is just another view on the previous framework that we just modeled. 
We'll extend this little classified threats. So this is everything that we've just run through, but now rebased on Salsa. This work is going to uh, go into the OpenSSF and be used as, uh, as a basis for building a full software supply chain security model. If anyone would like to contribute into that work, uh, we'd very happily take collaborators. Now, we'll look briefly at the same thing with, uh, with a graph. Can you imagine how much could go wrong? So what we're looking at here Sorry, mind if I have a sip of yeah, water? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. A lot of words there, Andy, a lot of words. <sighs> it's word salad. So, what we're looking at here are the threats to a uh, portion of the build system. And we'll expand this picture. These are some controls that we can apply to the build system. As you can see, there is non-exhaustive but reasonably long list of things that we have to consider at all stages. This is the pre-build stage, so before we've even started to build our application, looking at private workers to build repos. Then we have the build itself, that sacrosanct build test publish phase, exploding that out. Here are more risks that we have to deal with and some controls that we can use. Again, there is a lot of work to go on here, a lot of moving pieces. We're talking full automation, infrastructure as code, rebuildability, fundamental to securing these things. And then finally, the post-build. Can you imagine how much can go wrong? We build attack trees for these kind of things so that we can quantifiably understand where our control should be and the countermeasures efficacy in the face of all of these potential threats. So there's lots of good stuff going on here. The CNCF uh, Tag Security Group and the OpenSSF both do a huge amount of work in this space. If you would like to know more, please do come and reach out afterwards. We're both available on Twitter. Find us in the community in various places, and I will go and have a throat sweet before lying. I pass over to you, good sir. All right. So, I mean, I, I think what's pretty clear from the, from the threat model, and obviously no one's expected to take all of that in in one go, right? But I think the point of that, the S-bombs are only really useful to us as part of a much larger system that's based on trust and attestation. There are so many failure points in the, uh, in the use and management of them where if we don't deal with trust properly, we can basically make that S-bomb completely worthless, right? We're back to that thing about it's just a bunch of JSON and the, the magic bullet is not really about the JSON itself, it's about you know, how, we, uh, how we work these things into our software development lifecycle. But that is uh, not to say at all that S-bonds aren't uh, a very good thing. They help us to understand the dependency tree and used properly, they can uh, uh, allow us to analyze our infrastructure for known vulnerabilities, as well as to manage that, uh, that supply chain security as, as part of that uh, system. But we've got to kind of treat them as software. We've got to think about their life cycle, how we create them, how we manage them. Um, We've got to be able to verify them at all points where we're going to use them. And we need to give them some love, right? We've got to put the things into them that uh, we really care about. So that's all, folks. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And we are happy to take any questions. Are we? <laughs> Come on, you must have some questions. Yes, sir. Red button on the bottom, I think, Andy. Or I can just repeat the question. So you need S bombs from your upchain suppliers. Um, and you want to give S bombs to your downstream customers? How does that transfer happen, generally speaking? Uh, do you want to answer that? Well, what's the, so the question was, how does that transfer happen from taking an S bomb from upstream to uh, passing it on to your downstream consumers of, of your software, right? Yeah, especially if you're delivering embedded software. I mean, there's, there's different approaches. I think there's probably people in the audience that would have a view on this as well. Um, it can be packaged in the artifact itself. It can be packaged as a separate OCI artifact. It can be treated as if it was a checksum, so delivered via a different channel. So sort of back in the day of where we verify a SHA of a downloaded artifacts. 
but, but I wonder if uh, Puerco or Mike have an answer. To get into more trouble in, with, with that question, uh, there are cases where the upstream vendor, if I have bought chips or anything else, will refuse me the right to deliver any S bombs to my customers for their devices. That's getting the whole situation even more complex because it adds a new layer called legal, which is painful. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the question is pretty valid, though, right? Because I think that's one of the things that is still kind of emerging on, you know, I mean, I, I know for containers, we store them in, in, uh, in OCI registries, right? But I don't think that's a solved problem for every space in which you would want to distribute S bombs. And it could be the case as well that, like VEX, because they're temporarily bound, they probably want to be even behind an API somewhere, because... If your artifact is hashed and content addressable, which is the point of, of an S bomb, then it may be that you can provide them via API as well. But um, yeah, it, it's still it, it's done in different mechanisms for different places at the moment. I mean, we've definitely heard stories about people delivering them on paper, right? <laughs> which you know, I think that's the kind of if you're delivering it on paper and putting it in a file, that's not really solving your supply chain security problems. Yeah, I guess uh, just to compliment and answer to you. Uh, if your supplier does not provide you an S bomb, don't buy. <laughs> Just don't buy anything from the supplier. Uh, the problem is they will provide me an S bomb, but don't give me the right to distribute it. But you, you said something that triggered me, uh, uh -oh. coming from ITF you. and the pro <laughs> world of protocols. You said API for the VEX. I mm -hmm. haven't seen anyone focusing on that. I mean, S bomb is tied to a particular release, but VEX is a constantly changing document, mm. right? And the discovery of where to download that, the discovery that there's something new, this is a protocol question, really, that we need to start looking into. It's yes. not like I want every single vendor to do different APIs and have to implement thousands of different APIs and crazy stuff. Exactly. I want a standard here. So yep. this time last year, um, I, I did a, a talk at Open Source Summit in Dublin, talking about VEX and kind of the emergence of the standard. Um, I was tempted for that talk to build the API. So I started to ruminate on what this looks like. It's all down to trust. <laughs> it, it's all down to trust again. So who is providing that VEX document? Is it the vendor? Great, okay, but they've made a mistake. So what about as a security consultancy, that wants to assure that piece of software, well, do I get to publish one? Then who do we trust? Who ultimately trusts the signing keys? Where's that root of trust? Because it's not the same as certificate roots of trust, where we've got those global TAs, or DNS, where we've got the signers. So we're into a federated API for VEX. And I gave up at that point. I thought, this is not a bit too much for one talk. Um, too yeah. <laughs> so uh, too gave up. <laughs> it, it's currently unsolved, I think. Really, the, the closest anchoring for that should be the, the vendor. If there is a vulnerability in the dependency graph, the vendor can say, we've run, I don't know, symbolic execution, and we're 100% sure that you can't get here. Or it's an open source package, and we've removed the function that has the vulnerability when we package up the software. Or we tree shook whatever the, I mean, from a JavaScript perspective, it's the same thing. But it all comes down to trust, and if you're a big bank, you have a financial relationship on paper with the vendor where they have a responsibility. If it's open source, it's, uh, it, it is an individual trust relationship. So I didn't really want to get more involved than that, but um, yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, um, so, so two things. Uh, one is uh, the live stream says OCI refers API um, as, as potentially a mechanism cool. to distribute. Yeah. Um, that was from Brendan Mitchell. Uh, but I think the um, 
from the open source perspective, I know one of the biggest concerns has been um, the cost of distribution because uh, you know these these uh, they're being slammed enough with all sorts of stuff, and to come in and now say, hey, we now need to have a whole new mechanism, potentially a whole new set of APIs that we now need to support and now need to pay for and and all that. Um, my question, though, actually is is around. Um, I'm curious thoughts around. Uh, I noticed that most SBOM generators today strip out the actual transitive dependency information. They just sort of say, here is the list of dependencies I found in your build, in your container, but not the relationships between those things. And often it's the relationships between those things where the, the security comes into play. I'm curious if you have any thoughts around you know, how to fix that or, or how to, <laughs> yeah. I know it's the hard question. Uh, yes. I mean, I, yes, it's a hard question. It is a hard question. The, <laughs> It's misaligned incentives again to some extent, I think. As a maintainer, you don't want to have to uh, be issuing point releases for a, for a dependency graph of 1,000 packages. And you end up with an unreasonably sized SBOM that is, it takes a long time to verify. And if you're going to go and run a hash function over every single file system uh, kind of node, uh, it's going to take you a long time. So that's almost intractable. For a certain size of application, it's, it's yeah, almost intractable. Um, and then on the other hand, if you are capturing all of that dependency information as a consumer, then you have a lot of work to do and, uh, and, and you're back into um, kind of overexposure to alert fatigue. So I, I'm not quite sure where the solution is. Um, I, I defer no, to I, you. No, I have nothing to add other than that I don't know either. But thanks for the question. <laughs> I love these loaded questions from supply chain security experts. <laughs> yeah. and anyone else got one? It's a set up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in the idea of, I, I was so curious when I heard about as well enrichment and trusting as well in the same talk. Because to me, whenever you enrich an SVOM, you're essentially creating a new document, right? So in a world where we can get trusted SVOMs, which is not quite here yet, how do you envision transitioning that trust from the original SVOM to the enriched SVOM? That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I think enrichment, enrichment is, is clearly something that uh, we see people doing once they have that trusted SBOM already, right? So it's something that you would do internally as an organization. And, you know, I mean, uh, I think everybody ultimately has to make their own decisions about what, you know, what they want to, to put into that, into that document. Um, I, I think parlay is, a, is a, a, a sort of proof of concept in a way about what's possible with, with that. And we, we may actually see a lot of SBOM creators adding that information. You know, I think the whole thing's kind of still in flux, which is the point about it, really. But there's clearly stuff that end users care about that SBOM, most SBOM creation tools are not currently doing to the level that... So uh, the use case is more of a last mile right now for the... It, exactly, the yeah, because they're so subjective about what does your organization care about, you know, and, and, you know, what are the things that within your build pipeline you need to see within that document? So, yeah, I definitely don't see it as being something which, uh, which a, a, a vendor of software would enrich and then pass that on. I think it, because it's so subjective, I think it's, it's down to what, what you what you want as an organization. Well, we I can, mean, I we, think we the vulnerability can... data is an interesting one, right? Because where do you want that VDR type stuff? You know, one place that you can do it in the spec is in the SBOM itself. But... I wonder, would you potentially use an external reference for the previous version and just say, this is a totally different SBOM. It's now signed for my level of trust yeah, in it. Yeah. I mean, obviously tools will not then go and verify the thing. So you can kind of put whatever you want in it. You need another manual step to do it. But yeah, some link between them would be the only way, I think. Like a descendant. Yeah, that use case is like 
applies to so many different documents in the supply security space. So uh, maybe solving it once for all would be mm. a good idea. So. Mm. Inheritance. Okay, thank you very much, folks. <laughs>